again, not not trying to uh, uh, give you a definition. I think our biggest mistakes in all of this is is when someone defines. You'll say, well, what does that mean? And they'll give you a definition. And the extent of your understanding is based upon the definition given by another limited human, be human being. How many, if, if you had to right now, somebody say, who is God or what is God? Could you really define it? But we can use words such as he's an infinite entity. We can use words such as he has no beginning or end and yet at the same time knowing that he had no beginning or end. Our minds, I was up this morning thinking about that. Our minds cannot even conceive no beginning or end. We, we can't even, I would get a headache trying to figure out when did God show up. And then if I say God is always was, then I'm still getting a headache because what was that? So there are certain things I think that we, we shouldn't even uh, bang our heads against the wall trying to understand except for the things he's given us to understand. And as he given it to us to understand, we should be studious enough and desirous enough to know those things he's talking about. One of those things, I think, again, is we, this word grace. I've never seen so many people, especially supposed to be saved people. If anybody should understand the grace of God, it's the people that are saved. You know why? Because it's by grace. And yet, we don't even understand it. You know what I'm saying? We don't understand grace. Now, the moment you start talking about grace, the first thing people will start to saying again and again, man, they preach too much grace. They're giving people license to sin. Let me tell you something. Can't nobody give you nothing you ain't already got. Hello? You already, when you took your first breath, you got a license to live. <laughs> and with that license, you had a license to do whatever you wanted to do. At least that's what you tell me. Right? And so now, all of a sudden, we preach grace, and now you're telling me that now I'm giving you a license of sin? I can't give you nothing you already got. You know, if, if God, who is all-powerful, can't stop you, then who am I? All right, so I need to understand grace. I need to understand how grace works. Because evidently, it doesn't work like the other stuff used to work because if he did, he went about grace in. Amen. He makes a comment, makes a statement. He said, the law came by Moses. Okay? Now, he makes a distinction of what he brings. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, if he was trying to mix the two together, he could have just said, here, Moses and Jesus done brought the law, the grace, and truth to you. But he didn't. He said Moses was a, a man over his, over his house. And here Jesus is God over not just his house, but he's God over the whole universe. Let's read real quickly. I'm not going to go through all that again, but I'm going to read the text to us again. It says, therefore, being justified by faith. In other words, you're saved by faith. You are treated as if you've never sinned by faith. This is God's business. This is not my business. This is God's business. He's the one who justified you. All right? Nobody else can justify you. God justified you. The Bible goes on to say, and we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, if you, if you don't believe what he just said in the beginning, you've been justified by faith, you're not going to have peace with God. Our unrest in our life is an unrest soul that we got, an unrest spirit that causes us to be robbed of peace. And that has to do, most of all, is the world 
Most of the world we live in today live under guilt and condemnation. I don't care where you go. I don't care who you talk to. Somewhere, all out here, every morning, every day, people are getting up with this unrest in their spirit, not knowing that the only way you're going to find peace in this world, you're going to have to find it from the peace giver, and his name is Jesus Christ. And so you don't have peace, and, you, and when you lack peace, it's because you need to get a new manifestation. You, you can't have Jesus without having peace. Right? All right. You, you can't buy peace. You can't even put a symbol and get peace. I know you want to put a little dove on the back of your truck <laughs> with an olive branch. <laughs> That's not peace. All right. It looks good, but it's not peace. Now, by whom also we have access by faith unto his grace. Where? How? Mm, 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 mm. I had one brother tell me, my dear friend, man, he said, man, we, we, need to, we need to pray until we can get back to the throne room of God. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. So first of all, see, faith is not a flesh work. Faith is spiritual. There are a lot of things that if I say that people are going to try to misconstrue what I'm saying. But you need to understand one thing. Faith came before the Bible got here. You know how I know? Because I read it in the Bible. <laughs> and the Bible said by faith, Abraham, he wasn't quoting the Bible, was it? No. By faith, Noah built, he didn't, get, he didn't read the Bible? No, so let us not forget one thing. Faith was even before we had the book. Those men were living in the faith of God, just like you and I is supposed to be living by the faith of God. He believed before you believed. He believed in you before you had an opportunity to believe in him. You didn't just, you, you know, we act like God was lost. We act like somewhere, if it weren't for us finding him, he'd been lost forever. <laughs> it's just the opposite. <laughs> Man, I found the Lord. No, you didn't. No, if anything, he found you. It, you ain't never, ain't nobody ever found him. Because no matter what we done, we was always lost. They had a temple in Jerusalem. They didn't find God there. You know what? They were lost. So here Jesus came, robed himself in flesh so that he could find us. He found me. I can't tell you that, man, the only reason why I found the Lord because I tried to change my life around. No, I hadn't changed not one thing when he found me. I didn't even know nothing about making those. I tried to make a few changes when God began to deal with me, but I didn't know what he really required. I, didn't, I just thought he wanted me to put a band-aid on things, kind of tone it down. That's what I felt. But you know what? He didn't come to put a band-aid on your old life. And we're still fixing, working on broken parts, unhealed hearts, unhealed spirit, broken spirits, we're still trying to put up, we're still trying to find somebody can use some psychiatry on us, but, but do a mind game. Take it back. You remember when, you know, you got abused. Friend, get off of this self-victimizing stuff. We all been victims of Adam. We all been a victim, all right? Jesus came to become the victim for all victims so that we can be the victors. Yes. Huh? The victors. Yes. And we'll start right here still licking wounds talking about what somebody done. I don't care what they done. What I'm more concerned about now is what he done. Because yes. mm -hmm. what he done is more powerful than anything they done. 
That's what grace is about. Grace is not about you trying to fix something. Grace is you seeing what God done fixed for you. Huh? He already fixed some things. We're just walking in his faith, you allowing his life to be lived out through us. We don't know when he's going to pop up, show up, act up. We don't know what he's going to do. We have no idea, Brother Thornton, what's, what the date and tomorrow's going to be. I may make some plans. I may say what I'm going to do, but per venture. God may change his mind. You know, you know what happened to us? We try to put God on appointment and then we get disappointed because God doesn't meet our appointment. And you can't be disappointed until you had an appointment. <laughs> but anyway, praise God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also knowing, and I went through all how the progression, the processing, you know, people trying to know God because they read somebody's book about God. You don't know no more about God than the person you're reading his book about God. They don't know God either. And you're still trying to get their ideas about the God that they say they know. Look here, God wanted to make it very personal to you and I. He don't want you to get secondhand information. He said there ain't but one mediator between, between God and man, and his name is Christ Jesus. If I want to know who God is, who, who do I really need to talk to? I need to talk to him. If I'm going to know anything about Jesus, I need to talk to Jesus. If he ain't about gossip, he still ain't about gossip. <laughs> do you know what? Do you know about, do you know anything about Jesus? No. I, you know what? But he shows me this. There's certain things that God uses to make his, uh, to manifest knowledge to you. So you can't know God just by reading the book. Because if that's the case, then everybody should know God. Hallelujah. Go ahead. He's going to manifest himself to you. Just like now, we got, a, we got a legacy here. This Bible here gives us a lot of things about God that should enhance your faith in God to believe that God is. But the book is not there to prove God. God was here before the book, so he don't need proof. He, you know, even the creation, they that don't have a God know there is a God. All right, so it's not here to prove. We're not, we use the Bible to try to prove God. But see, God is not trying to prove himself. He just wants you to know him. Amen. All right, and, and if you know him, you ain't got, I ain't got to prove to you that God exists. I just got to know he does. All right, so I'm not here to prove anything. You get people say, well, yeah, well, you say God is real. If God is real, tell God to do this. That's not, that's not what this Bible is about. It's, it's for you. When I read this book, I should be enhanced. My, my faith should be enhanced. God is not going to go back and repeat any of those things that we're trying to make him repeat. He's not trying to build another ark. He's not trying to build another tabernacle. He's not trying to do any of that. And so we can go back and read and see what he did do. But how does that, re how does that relate to us today? What is it that God wanted to do to us here now? What is it that God has given us that we are not taking advantage of now? If God says there's a new creation, a new birth, born again, what is it that we've been born again into? What then becomes the kingdom? Because now we've got the kingdom mixed up. We've got the kingdom of these world, of the world taking preeminence over the kingdom of God in our life. We, what, what, what has got us all tied up right now? You know what got us all tied up? This world. Okay? We, we're stuck like Chuck. We got umbilical cords to too many different places. We're not getting nourishment from the very thing that we need the nourishment from. We're not getting the strength. It's because we can't draw strength from things that don't have life. And we give more energy to stuff that don't matter. Don't matter, don't, not a hill of beans, don't even matter, but it takes, we're down praying, go, oh God, Lord, you need to change the situation, oh God, and he ain't died for not one of those situations. If we're going to have the grace of God, we've got to understand, it's, you're not going to cook it up, he's giving it to you. It is the gift of grace. I need to know how it saves me. I need to know, if, it's, if that's my salvation, I need to know how it saves me. I really do. 
I need to know how grace work. I need to know beyond the, this, this little generic definition we have, it is the unmerited favor. Yes, grace means favor. And most people that have grace don't even know they got favor. You know why? They're praying, God, give me favor. If I've already got favor, I ain't got to pray for favor. I heard somebody say, Lord, I'm asking God to bless you. Let me tell you something. If you never ask God to bless me, you ain't going to believe this. I'm blessed without your permission. Hello? I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not really trying to impress anybody because I need to know who I am in him. So I'm not asking you, you pray that God bless me. No, you ain't got to pray that prayer for me because he's already prayed it for me. When he called me into this thing, you know what he called me in? He called me into his blessings. Yes. Hmm? I've been blessed with all spiritual blessings yes. in heavenly places. Okay. But if my mind is earthly, I'll never see the true riches of his blessings. Let the motor run a little bit. Because you hear everybody always talking about blessings, but their blessings are always temporal. God blessed me with a new dress. You ain't going to worry about one time. It was that bless you. You know, I keep it on. <laughs> no, man, I'm not. I ain't saying nothing. God blessed me with this car. Two years later, guess what? That blessing got old. Now, don't get me wrong, but I'm, what I'm trying to show is this. We get caught up on these low-level stuff. Low-level stuff. When I say low-level stuff, low-level stuff. Well, I told them Thursday night, people praying about houses, praying about cars, praying about stuff. You know what? The Bible tells me I ain't even got to pray for that. Okay? I ain't, I'm not going on no fast with my belly button falling out my back trying to ask God to give me any of those things. You know what I'm going to do? If, I'm gonna, if my belly button falling out my back is because I'm going to be seeking him first yes. and his kingdom and his, and his righteousness yes. and all, all. Yes. See, I'm going to believe that over anything else. Man, I've been working hard all my life. Been working, work hard all you want to because when you get to the work and you're going to hear Jesus say the same thing. Yes. Come unto me. All you that labor and heavy laden and I Ain't that something you've been, you're going to work all your life when you could have been resting? I ain't talking about jobs. I, I'm not talking about eight-hour jobs. I'm not talking about going to work to some company. I am talking about that religious work you go, that goes on in your head. Yes. I'm talking about being frustrated because you're trying to go forward and God ain't going nowhere. But everything you're trying, everything you're trying ain't working. And most of that is because of this. Number one, you haven't believed what he told you. You know, I read every letter that Paul wrote in this book. Do you know one uh, phrase that's in every letter? Except for the book of Hebrews. Every letter, he always wrote something like this. Grace and peace. You ever think about that? Every time he wrote a church, grace and peace. It almost like he had to remind them over and over. Don't forget, grace and peace. But I really think the crowd that he talked to, especially a lot of the Jewish crowd, they had such a law mentality. Number one is that they, most of them did not want the grace of God. Grace was too easy. Grace was so easy that, you know, it's like most people said today, oh, you mean tell me you ain't got to do nothing? No, you really don't. If you, if you believe Jesus, he'd be doing it. Or he'd be showing you what he's already done, if you really believe it. 
Because you're not going to recreate something he's already created. Huh? If he said it's finished, you're not going to unfinish it to do it again. All right? So I, I, I need to understand now, he's drawing me into something. He's cut, he said, I'm going to save you by grace. I made you accepted in the beloved by grace. And so I need to understand grace and I quit saying all this faithless stuff. Man, I need to get closer to God. Grace has bought me and gave me access to it. So what's stopping me from being always in his presence? Okay. Well, he goes on and talks about tribulations and, and stuff that we pray that we don't have to go through and every time something comes up that's inconvenient us. And I know I ain't just talking to you. I can talk to myself because I've been on the same highway, you know, and it's always like when I'm doing my best, it looked like God tried to do his worst on me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's when I'm really out there trying to get it done, seeing like God doesn't show up. See, like he gets, goes the opposite way. And so just understanding some of the things that God allows in our life. And if I thought for one minute that God was not cognate of me, he didn't know where I was. If I just thought for a second that somehow God got me mixed up with somebody else and I got lost somewhere in the, in the translation, then I would be afraid. But then I had to remember, God always knows where I am. He knows exactly where I am, what I need, where I am, and he's going to give me everything that I need when I need it. I said, now, he may not give me all the things I want because if he gave me everything I want, Decatur probably wouldn't be able to hold it. <laughs> so I know he ain't going to give me everything I want because if he gave me everything I want, I'd be a small brat. Ain't no telling what I'll be doing. Ain't no telling what would happen to me if I got everything I wanted. Well, it sounds nice. I wish I had everything I wanted. Man, do you, do you realize how messed up that would be? How messed up your life would be is if you got everything you wanted because you get so wore out with stuff after a while you wouldn't want anything probably because you didn't have it all. Okay, so I know God is going to supply all of my needs according, according in where? I like it. Turn to, turn to Ephesians chapter, chapter 1 here real quick. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I, I, I started reading some stuff today. Ephesians chapter 1. Now, 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 let's just start right here from the top. Verse, chapter 1, verse 1. Notice this. Paul and the apostle Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which were which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. What he said? Ain't that something? Man, Paul can't even preach. He couldn't even preach today in our Christian circles too much is because he's talked too much about grace. Isn't that something? Now, that's what I'm being accused of now, that I'm using grace too much. And you can't even have Jesus without having him. He is grace. Okay, so you're not, he, and the Bible talks about he's, a, he, he's a, the God of grace, he's the God of mercy, he's the God of everything they say he is, that's what he is. So let, let's not try to understand grace from a human standpoint. When I, need other, I need to understand grace from a higher standpoint than human mind. I need to understand when I talk about grace, when I talk about this grace we're talking about, because that, it has power to heal us, it has power to do a lot of things for us, and we understand what grace was. It's not you trying to get the power to do it. Grace is the power that God uses in your life to do what you could never do. That's why the Bible says you're saved by. And that's why the Bible says in Romans that you are saved by his life. You know why you're saved by his life? It's because you're saved by his grace. And you know what his life is? It's nothing but grace. Whew! It's favor. It's favor. His favor is our favor. Listen to this here. It says, 
Grace be to you and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Now, I'm telling you right now, you go through. I went through today and looked at this, and it just blew my mind because I didn't realize Paul used that phrase so much. Every letter he was writing, he was writing. Don't forget, grace and peace. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Now, many of us would have wrote, don't forget Moses. Don't forget what Moses said. No. Grace and peace. Don't you forget what Jesus said. Amen. Huh? Let this remain in your mind. You're going to be saved by grace through faith. Yes. And that not a works, lest any man should boast. And I never fully understood it until I finally realized is that what we've done in religion is that we boasted in our stuff. My church is better than yours. My Jesus. No, you ain't been saved by grace yet. They ain't no boasting. I'm holier than they are. No, you ain't been saved yet. Because if you think you're holier than somebody else, then you don't, you don't understand grace. What you boasting in yourself? Because there's none holy but God. Hmm? Well, I'm gooder than them. They ain't none good but God. And if you are standing there telling somebody how good you are, then you are boasting and you don't understand grace. You cannot understand grace. Grace will not make me look at you and say I'm better than you. Because I realize the same grace that saved me has got to save them. And so if I realize that, then I can never say that I'm better because there's one thing about grace. Grace is my salvation and grace is going to be their salvation. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Let me, let me, get, let me move on. The Bible says that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all. You need to mark that in your Bible. Somebody, somebody done tricked y'all many times telling people if you get in this line, God's going to give you a $50 blessing. Look here. You need to tell them. You know what he said? According, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. Blessed us. That means past tense. It, it means he ain't even doing it right now. What he's doing for you right now, he already done it. You, you're not blessed because you got up this morning and brushed your teeth right. Hello? You were blessed when you got up because the blessing he gave you is yours. It was yours when you got up for this day. That's why today, every day I wake up, I'm not looking at how many years I got left. I'm just thinking about all the days I got. Mm -hmm. I wake up every morning to a brand new day. I don't try to bring yesterday into my today. What yesterday was was yesterday. This is a new day. Do you know what God can do in a day? The Bible said in one day, God can build a whole nation. Yes. Hello? This might be the day that he does that for you. This might be the day you've been waiting on. So every morning I wake up, if that wasn't the day, I'm going to wake up and make faith the next day is the next day. If it's not the next day, the next day then. But I'm not living for years. I'm not telling you that I got 50 years left. I ain't going to tell you I got 10, but I can tell you this. If God will bless, keep blessing, I'm going to have another day. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to get up the next day and say, Lord, give me my daily. How many people? No, I ain't going to even ask. I ain't going to even ask. I ain't going to even ask. That would be, be too cruel to ask. Are we getting our daily bread? I ain't, I'm not, I, 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 don't ask. Don't, don't, don't say. Uh, uh, yeah. 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 That's the reason why daily bread is important. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, you know, see, the world have their own way of giving you daily bread. They call it daily news. But that daily news is not good news. <laughs> How many of you know that Jesus has daily bread like a daily newspaper? Amen. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and everything in that, he's going to be telling you that there's going to be some good news. Yes. But we don't want good news. We really don't. Good news does not give that emotions. 
There is nothing like bad news because people get emotionally involved more in bad news than they will be in good news. See, if I came in here smiling and said, boy, I'm doing all right, you're going to shake my hand and run on past me now. But if I come in here snotting and crying, <laughs> now you're going to be real concerned about me. And not really trying to get me up, but really trying to get down where I am. You know what I'm saying? You know, you know have you ever noticed that? Yeah. And you'll be over here snotting and crying. <laughs> it's going to be all right. You know, you know how we do. We, we get totally invested in negative emotions. We, we, divest, we invest strength because it's a lot easier to seem to slide down than to get up. And so we'll invest a lot of, how, how long do you stay mad? How long do you invest in that? You, you, you ever been mad? Do you, do you realize how much energy you invest in being mad? Huh? Blood pressure, sky high, veins in your neck popping. Your brain is running like it got no oil on the gears. And you're just really just turning and turning and turning. And the more you want to quit talking about it, the more you got to talk about it. And the more you talk about it, the matter you get about it. And then you want to say, Lord, forgive them. But then you can't forgive them because you got to come back and talk about it again and start them emotions all over again. It don't even matter. See, what we fail to realize is that we all done something stupid. No, we all. But see, we, you know what we're trying to do? We're trying to gauge life from here, and God is looking down. He said, when I looked down on the earth, they were all stupid. He didn't say it like that. He said, but they all have sinned and came short. And so it looks like even though what we see in each other, God looked down and seen all of us in the same pot. Isn't that something? But then he said, but I'm going to give you the gift of grace. Because mm. I looked down and didn't see nobody getting a hit on nothing. You was all silly. Yeah, all the things that we want to say about others, we were all that. Even Paul talked about one place where it said, he went down and gave a whole list of things, and such were some of, but thanks be unto God, if it was not for the grace of God, we'd all be consumed by it. All right, so here, here you go. Now listen to him. He said, I done blessed you with all spiritual blessings. Now how many people are looking, how many people are really looking heavenly to get a blessing? Really? Because see, it, it's not going to come in the form of stuff that you can touch. Spiritual blessing? No. No, no, no. You're not going to be the, hold on. You see, the Bible says anything that I can see is temporary. Okay. So God really came to give you something greater than temporary stuff. But you know what we want to do? We want to see our blessing. I got to be able to touch my blessing. Yeah, no, but God said, I, but I blessed you. And this is where we, we, we begin to make that mark of deep, uh, debarkation in God is that God, I understand that you gave us spiritual blessings, but you know, you bless me spiritually, you're nobody going to be able to see it. You, you ever notice, you, you know, we're in America. I love America. God bless America. But see, in America, we are, we are like uh, a show and tell kind of people. If we got it, it ain't no fun having it if nobody know you got it. Huh? If, if you got anything, you know where the fun comes? When you can show somebody else you got it. And then when you show them that, yeah, when they, you can, they can see it. And all of a sudden, they, they're in your corner because they can see what you, yeah. You know, first thing they say, if you get something they can see, we love for them to say to us, 
Man, God's really blessed you. Look what God done gave you. No. But see, the real blessing wasn't the stuff that you seen. Mm -mm. No, the real blessings is the stuff you can't put your fingers on. The real riches of God, you will never be able to spend it nowhere. And, uh, you know, believe it or not, money is a blessing, but it's not the blessing. You know why? The Bible calls it carnal stuff. Carnal thing. But what consumes you more, carnality or spirituality? Hello? Okay. So here we go. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you hey, it's, it's money is evil. Don't get it, you know. I, I'll tell you this right now. You can't have mine right now. I can tell you that. <laughs> I love you. But these two pennies I got right here, these are all mine here. All right. <laughs> so he said, but I bless you with all spiritual blessings. Everybody says spiritual blessings. Spiritual blessings. What would you be looking for if you were looking for a spiritual blessing? Don't, don't, don't tell me. Uh, these are rhetorical questions that you ask, ask yourself when you're alone with God. What, what is it, what spiritual blessing am I missing? See, I understand what we do in Pentecost. I understand how, how we conduct ourselves in Pentecost. And most things that we do, and even now, I, I mean, we can dance. And we're blessed to dance. We're blessed to breathe. You're blessed to do all that. And a lot of times our blessing, our spiritual blessings come from because we shout it. And we'll say, boy, didn't God bless? No, you sweated and you got real hot and you was praising God. But now what did you come away with? Did you come away with more wisdom? Did you come away with more peace? Because most of our Pentecostal stuff is predicated on how well the music is played and not my, how much revelation of Jesus we have. You know what I'm saying? There has to be, you can't understand grace. You're not even understanding your praise until you understand grace. Yeah. Now watch this. Now, the re reason I'm saying it because I came to a place in here this morning. Woo! I sat back in my seat for a minute. Look at here. He says, according as he has chosen us in the, him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. When, when did he choose you now? Oh, oh, so he, he had some things already in place before you showed up. Okay, let's keep going then. Having predestined it, predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So it was his will to adopt you, to save you. And his pleasure, not only that, it was his pleasure. And his goodwill to do that. It wasn't nothing that I done. It wasn't that I treated my mama right. One because I walked the old lady across the street on a cane. It was because of his pleasure and his will. I had no idea as a little boy walking in the mud, bare feet, that God had done such a thing for me. I had no idea. But even then, I said, you know what, before the foundation of the world, I'd already kind of like adopted you as my kids before you knew you was my kids. I was working when you didn't even thought I was even near you. I was doing things then. You know, I go back now and, and, and think about some things that have happened in my life, and it almost scares me to think that, boy, what if God wasn't there? What would have happened? But you know why it didn't happen? Because I was called for his pleasure and his purpose. I don't, you know, I don't, anymore, I don't worry about the day when I check out on this side. I'm not even worried about this. You know why? Some people are, but I'm not. It's because, see, I come here in this world, don't even know anything but what God can let us know. I can't be talking about going to the other side because I don't even know what's over there. And so the only thing I can do is enjoy 
everything God is doing for me right here, right now. The only thing. But he said, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. Now let's look at this here. To the praise of the glory of his grace. Woo. To the praise. To the glory. So grace has glory. And not only that, grace is praise. And then I think sometimes we ought to really begin to think about the grace we have and give thanks a lot for his grace. Lord, I thank you for the grace that you've given me. I thank you for that grace. You're talking about praising. Praise the glory of his grace. And here are all these things we keep reading about grace. Paul keep telling us, grace, grace. Well, I don't want to preach grace because grace ain't right. Well, show me what ain't right. If you show me where grace ain't right, I'll show you where Jesus is not right. Uh-uh. Because you can't have one without the other. You got to decide, do you want grace? Because if you don't want grace, you don't want Jesus. The part of the Galatians problem, the Galatian church had a problem with grace. They had a problem with it. They didn't want the grace of God. Or they wanted to include the grace of God with the law of Moses, and it wouldn't work. Faith, yes ma'am. Okay, now how, how, now let me ask you a question now. How would you live in sin now? Do you know how you're going to live in sin? If you reject grace, you can't help but live in sin. All right, so I need to understand grace then. I already know what sin is. Okay, uh, uh, what, uh, you know when people go and do that, for, that's, that's the first thing they want to say. Well, how can we live therein? You're right. Live in what? You see, the covenant, the old covenant is the covenant of sin. It's the law covenant. Now, I need to remove, I need to get past there and get into real grace of, of fellowship with God. How do you don't know God through the law? You can't even know him through the law. And he told, even if you kept every bit of the law, you're still a sinner. Yeah, but, but I'm saying though. Okay, what, what, what is the newness of life then? Okay, now how does that work? I'm talking about the newness of life. Everybody tell me. Now you're right. What you're saying is true. I love it. Because you know what? The only thing we've done, we just changed a couple of places we went to. But the newness of life, we do not know. We're still doing the same. We're conducting business the same way the world conducts business. We're doing the same thing they're doing, only we just change positions, change places. Uh, okay. You still walking as much, most saints that they are walking in just as much unbelief as they was before they found Jesus. Now, first of all, you, you want to look at one of the letters and find your sin. I'm going to look at the book of Genesis and find that anyone who's walking in unbelief is walking in sin. So now, would you say, now, this is why you need grace. Okay? Because grace is what's going to do for you what you can't do. All right, so now, I don't know of anybody that will stand up and say that I don't have any unbelief in my life. Well, then you're still in sin. And the only way you're going to come out of that is that you've got to get in grace. How are you going to get in grace? I've got to get in Jesus. Not just in doctrine. Not just in doctrine. It's more than a doctrine. It's more than, 
and talking about my church is apostolic, it's more than doctrine. You can be in the apostolic church, don't mean you're in Jesus. We have not developed a relationship. What, what does it mean when it says, Jesus is the end of the law to all them that believe? What does that mean? Well, what I'm saying, these questions I'm not asking you, these are questions we should be asking ourselves. If Jesus says, I am the end of Moses to them that believe. Now, a new beginning is a new beginning. You know, I had this sign up here. New creation is not a recreation. Remember that? Okay, it's the same. See, when God said you're going to be born again, you got born again. But you know what we done? We done with the Jews. Done. We got born again, and we, somebody went and sold that veil back up and told us God could not be had like that. So we went back, and we've been seeking God ever since. We go from altar, go come in the church, ask God to give us our sin, go back out, and still ain't made a change. You know why the same attitudes we had keep coming back? Because you can't change that. You can't change that. The only way you're going to change, you got to be in the presence of God. If you can behold him, you're going to change. Otherwise, you can't change. Because you're operating, sin is more than an action. Sin is a nature. And you were born with, that's why if you've never done anything, you're still just as lost. Okay, so you're not going to base your salvation up on your works. That is impossible. That's why he said, by faith, by grace, through faith, are you saved? Not of works. What? What is dead works? What would you think of dead works? There you go. Okay. A dead man trying to give God some dead praise, some dead works. Anything your human flesh can conjure up to give to God is dead. That's why we walk by the Spirit. You know why the Bible said be filled with what? No, not, not yeah, not Harold Review, not CNN, not uh, Dr. So-and-so, but be filled with the Spirit. And when you become filled with the Spirit, guess what that does? You will not fulfill Okay, now what is the lust of the flesh? The pride of life. Ah. So what I say, the eye. Pride of life, the eye. Uh, looking, uh, desiring, and wanting all these things of the world. Why? Because I got a new nature. See, most people ain't living out new nature. They're trying to live on the old nature and try to make it like Ishmael before God. It's dead works. If I'm working to make my salvation work, then I'm, I, that's dead works. The only works that work is the work that he worked. And it's by that grace that he done, you didn't go to Calvary. Okay? You was not buried. But he was. And he did that as you so that he could also raise up and give you what he got out of that deal. Because you could, if you died, you can't do them but stay dead. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. You're right. Okay, so these things is of the world. These are things that we live by. And, and most, that's why the Bible says the just, we do not walk by. But how do we live? The just shall live by. So evidently, faith ain't what you see. Right? Okay, so God is not, first of all, we are so sin conscious that the only thing we can ever think about stopping the grace of God is trying to stop it with sin. What do he say? Where sin abound, grace did what? It, it got bigger than the sin. But what we want you to focus on is the thing, the sin, and not the grace. And when we focus on the sin, all, all the only thing we can do is have a sin conscious. Now, he came to give you a new mind. Do you think Jesus came, all he done was focus on sin? Well, now, why would he tell you, let this mind that was in Christ? You know, when he seen people, you know what he saw? He saw the opportunity for grace to work. Woman taken in adultery. What worked there? Law? 
or grace? Grace worked. Isn't that something? Now, they were under the law. And according to the law, she should have been killed. Look at grace. I saw him hanging on the cross. Two thieves on either side. What did that man do? That malefactor. What did he do to be saved? He, all the things he said, Father, he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, what work did he perform? Now, we already know you're a crook. He, he already a crook, right? Now, he's on that cross because he deserved to be there. But here is grace working. Grace is not giving you what you deserve. Grace is giving you what Jesus has bought for you. Amen. All right? Go, yes, ma'am. Okay, that's exactly what grace does. Yes. But you got to be in fellowship. Did you notice that? Okay, so now if you're in fellowship with him, see, you, you, see you got to liken his, his body. We'll be a part of that body. You know, and I think it talks about, you know, the, if the eye says I don't want to be a part, or the hand says I don't want to be a part, you know, can it separate itself from that? And see, this is where Christianity messed up because some of us don't want to believe in the grace that put us in that body. But if we're in that body, grace is flowing through all of us. And the, bl the blood of Jesus, no matter how filthy you are in him, is clean. It's in you every day, just like your body right now. We probably put some stuff in there last night. If it wasn't for your blood, you'd be dead. All right? But what he's saying is this. As long as we stay connected, yes. as long as we are connected, my blood will continually cleanse does that mean you get up every day right now? No. But I'm in his body, and guess what his blood's going to do? Going to cleanse. I got stuff to keep my body alive, but if I don't get it out of there when it needs to get out of there, it'll kill me. All right? It's like the man with palsy. The man with palsy means that you have consumed too much water, and you can't get rid of it. Okay? Water is good, but he had too much water. Couldn't get rid of the water. It's about to kill him. He needed healing. Same thing now is that when we understand the body of blood of Jesus Christ, and again, faith in his blood, what does his blood do? You know the man, you know, you know when they offer that lamb for sacrifice, did you realize that sacrifice was a sacrifice God was accepting, not because the man was right? Huh? He, he didn't have to be right to offer that sacrifice, but he did have to offer the right sacrifice. Okay? It's the same thing with your life today. What sacrifice can you offer to God? None. Because God didn't judge the man. He's going to judge. And Christ was offered once. For who? For you. All right? He was offered one time for you. And you got to ask yourself, was he the perfect sacrifice? Because if he wasn't, you better find another sacrifice that God can accept. When I go to God, I can't tell God, Lord, I've been preaching for you for 40 years. I gave my life for 40 years, preaching your word. That means absolutely nothing. You know what means something? Over 2,000 years, he said, you know what? <laughs> I was your perfect sacrifice. Yes. And you was accepted not because of you. You was accepted because of me. Yes. Let, let's, let's read. Say, I've been accepted where? In the who? Oh, let me, oh, oh, uh, to the praise and glory of his grace, wherein he has made us accepted. In the beloved. He made you accepted. You know why? It's like, see, a lot of times we don't have a clear picture of the old covenant, of the old testament. And see, since we don't, 
A lot of these things we don't understand. Go back and read and see how it was, all these things had to be fulfilled in Christ. So I got to look at Christ and realize one thing. These men that were often, even the Bible tells you, even the men who offered the sacrifice had to offer sacrifice for themselves because you know why? Their mind wasn't right. Even the high priest who was a representation of the whole nation, he could even just go in. He had to make a sacrifice for himself because he wasn't right. And then bring an offering unto the holies of holies and hope that it was accepted by God. Now, Jesus said, I'm going to show you something. I am the only one that can make a sacrifice and go into the holes of holies and take the seat where the blood was poured upon, and I'm going to make that my throne and sit down on it myself. And when I sit down on this throne, because you got to understand what that throne was about, inside the Ark of the Covenant, there was the, the law, the manna, and the rod, when Jesus sat on that mercy seat, the laws of Moses was underneath him. And the last I read, he ain't moving off the seat. That's why when you understand, the advocate, the judgment of God for your life have already been declared not guilty. Not because you didn't do anything. You're not guilty because of the one who represents you, who did it for you, paid the price for you. You, you could not give yourself a life. The only life you can ever have is the life that God gives you. And so many times that we're trying to go back and tell God how good we are without recognizing how good he has been to us and how good he really is right now. It's not about you. It really is all about him. And if I don't see that, then I'm missing everything God is trying to show us. I'm going about the Jews, went about, the Bible said that God gave them some statues. They went about to establish their own righteousness. They did it in ignorance. They had a zeal for God. They thought doing more would cause God to get closer to them. So they went about trying to establish a righteousness. And, and we're still guilty today of trying to reestablish righteousness. Righteousness is of God and righteousness is of faith. Yes. The Bible says, know ye not that ye are the righteousness of God, where? In, so I'm not, I, I, you know, oh. to me, maybe I fell out the tree. But the more I begin to understand grace, the better this thing gets to me. It takes the pressure off of me because now I know I've been blessed, accepted, loved, all these things. God loves me. And ain't nothing like knowing you being loved by God. Oh, hallelujah. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. How rich is grace? My last statement. I'm going to quit after this. Isn't, isn't it strange? He said the riches of his grace. How many people in church and not this, this would, would, could even sit down and begin just to write anything about the riches of his grace? What, how rich is grace? Huh? No, we, we, we're not, we, I'm not even looking for an answer. I'm just, you know, I read stuff like this, the riches of his wisdom, the riches of his grace. How rich is grace? It's got to be pretty rich because what it done for you and I, millions of sheep couldn't do Amen. for the other people. Amen. I don't know how many sheep, lambs, bullocks, oxen was killed, but it wasn't rich enough to forgive them of their sin. But here Jesus come one time with four and a half, five pints of blood, whatever it is in our bodies. He came one time and he says, now, now you can see the riches 
of grace. What a million, millions of lambs could not do. As you kill the lamb, you still couldn't get in his presence. As you offered all them goats, you still couldn't get in his presence. He said, but what all that couldn't do, my grace is so rich that all I done was came as a perfect lamb that one time so that you could always come to me any time you want to. I don't have to have no benedictions. I ain't got to have no uh, uh, processional. I ain't got to have, I can come any time I want to. Uh, access to God is open any time I want it to be open. I can talk to God any time I want to talk to God, any day, any hour of the night. I can talk to God. Why? I ain't trying to force myself in. I'm already there. I have access. He said, I've blessed you with all spiritual blessings. I have made you to sit together. I have made you to sit together with me. I wonder, did he mean that? I wonder why the, it's the saints not excited. I, I, wonder why, I wonder why we're not excited to be in heavenly places. Because it seems like to me we're more excited being in earthly places than heavenly places. Huh? Now, he said, I made you to do this. See, I made it. And yet, heavenly places, put that in a hole for a minute. We're still trying to enjoy earthly things, earthly places. Why he's saying, I've given you spiritual blessings, well, you ain't going to be able to enjoy spiritual blessings in earthly places. Not if he made you to sit together with him in heavenly places. Guess where that blessing is going to look good at? In heavenly places. But you know what? We got Jesus on hold. We can't do that yet because we got to wait till we get over yonder. Can you see, can you see how the, I'm having a problem right now? Because grace gave me access to God's throne. Grace let me in. Grace said, hey, I paid it all. Grace said, I'm rich. I'm so rich. Grace. The riches of his grace. Grace is not poverty stricken. There's not one thing in your life that grace cannot handle. All right? Because grace is richer than your sin. Did I not say we're, we're sin about? Sound like grace got more money. Hello? Grace had more than sin had to offer. So you want me to stop preaching grace? You mean tell me I can't preach grace? And here you want to be in a poverty-stricken sin mentality where you're never going to get out of it anyway? All the way I know to get out is grace got to bring you out. All I know is that if grace don't save you, you ain't going to be saved. And you can go and, and start a picking with it all you want to and try to tear it down. But at the end of the day, it's going to be grace that saved us all. Amen. And without grace, no man will be saved. Not one. Not nary one. And sometimes we get on this kick where, you know, we don't call it boasting. We just call it, man, we right and everybody else is wrong. I, I'm not trying to figure out who is wrong and who is right. I know who's right now. You know, who, you know who's right? The righteous one. So I, the more I know how right he is, the more right I can be. Huh? I got to know him to be right. I, I can't sit down here and write out some stuff. I say, well, if I do one, two, three, I'm all right with God. No, this book is too full. You're going to miss something after a while. But you know what Grace done? Grace went and fulfilled all the book. Got all the things together, all the things you couldn't do. You know, you ain't got to worry about bringing no cows to church. None of that kind of stuff. You ain't got to worry about whether or not you got up on the Sabbath day and started working or not. You ain't got to worry about none of that kind of stuff anymore. Why? You can eat pork chops now. Pork steaks, pork chops, chitlins, hog maws, all of them. Believe it or not, grace paid for your high blood pressure, but I wouldn't keep on testing. 
Hello? I said, grace pays for it all, but I don't want to, I'm not trying to tempt God. I'm going to let grace teach me some things. As a matter of fact, is that grace is supposed to teach you some stuff. Grace teaches you how to abstain and how, which way to, grace teaches you stuff that nothing else can teach you, but grace can. I got to quit, got to quit. Question, statement. I, I hope to God that whatever I've said that I didn't try to make you mad, but I'm going to tell you something. Grace is rich. And the more, you, the more grace you begin to experience, the more humble you become because you realize it ain't you at all. <laughs> That's why the Bible says he giveth more grace to the who? Come on now. You can't know grace without humility. The more I can humble myself, the more I can see the grace. That's why Paul even talked about one while. He said, you know, I finally realized I'm going to start a glorying in my tribulation time. Hallelujah. How you know? Tribulations are very, it's humbling. Yes. You understand? There's nothing like being in this world and having a situation that you can't even do nothing about. Preach. Tribulations are humbling. Yes. But he said, you know what I'll give you if you just go ahead and humble yourself in that tribulation. Have patience. You know, stay under. Don't worry about it because I'm going to give you some grace to let you see one thing. You're going to make it through it no matter what. Yes. And Paul said, you know, anymore, I'm, I'd, rather, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God can be saved. You may look at me and say, you know, you look at Paul and look at that boy and say, boy, he couldn't have had too many victories. He sure look messed up. He don't look like a winner. He don't even look like he's conquered anything. He ain't looking like nothing. Paul said, you know what? I'd rather look like nothing so that the grace of God, the power of God can be demonstrated. Because I, I, I finally realized his grace is. Oh, thank you, Jesus. I love Jesus. Amen. You know why I find that? And, and these things I'm telling you right now, hey, something, I didn't know this early on. No. I'm going to fix it kind of guy. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to fix it. I wish I could learn about grace. I probably messed up more stuff than I fixed. You know what I'm saying? I wish I would have knew more about grace so that I would have quit trying to fix it and let God go ahead and show me what he done for it. God bless you today. In Jesus' name, amen.